So next up is uh, Tom Egan from Board of Mona. So he'll be final final speaker on this session. Um, Tom has been a member of the management team for uh, power generation assets for a number of years within Board of Mona. He's over 30, experience, 30 years experience on a, the global side. He's worked with E.ON, with General Electric, and has worked both in Ireland, North America, the Middle East, Asia and Africa on power projects across those regions. So Tom, you're very welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Noel, and uh, thanks for inviting me to, to speak here today. Look, I'm, I'm delighted to be here representing Board of Mona, and, and we're very happy to sponsor this event. We think it's a very important uh, event in the year. So, look, I'm going to look for a little bit of uh, audience participation here, uh, because one of the things I'm trying to do today is change your perception of Board of Mona. So, could I have a show of hands as to when I mention Board of Mona, who thinks of a peat briquette or a pile of turf? And the second question then is, who thinks of wind turbines or renewable energy, or who thinks of Bordemona as being one of the largest renewable energy producers on the island? That kind of kind of answers my question. So I'm hoping to change that perception throughout the uh, throughout the day. So, okay. So a little bit about Bordemona. So traditionally, Bordemona was based around peat. The company was formed uh, under the uh, Turf Act in 1946 to exploit the peat resources in Ireland. And at its peak, we were producing about six and a half million tonnes of, of peat a year. Iconic uh, images are the, the light rail system for transporting peat and the iconic boredom on a peat progress. So I can say by the end of December this year, we'll have no further involvement in any peat activities uh, on the island. The last peat briquette was produced in June this year, and the last peat will be consumed in Eden Dairy in December. So that brings a, a complete end to any activities in, in peat harvesting in Ireland. So Bordemona has made a massive transition in a very short period of time to being a very carbon intensive company to, to being almost 100% carbon neutral uh, company. And the power that we produce um, from 2024 onwards will almost be exclusively renewable energy, comprised of um, the, the plant in Eden Dairy, which is the single largest producer of renewable energy on the island, uh, a fleet of uh, wind turbines, we have some solar farms under construction, and we have some um, uh, uh, some battery projects under development also. We've also recently uh, signed a co-development agreement with one of the largest offshore wind companies in the world, a company called Ocean Winds, and we're developing two projects, one off the east coast and one off the south coast, about 2,000 megawatts. So we're fast becoming one of the largest producers of, of renewable energy on the island. So as I said, Bordemona has gone through a significant transition. At one time, we had a, a domestic fuels business. We're completely exited from that now. We had a horticulture business where we produced product and exported. That's completely closed down now. So we're left with, with three uh, businesses, three R's, renewable energy, recycling, and uh, land rehabilitation. So in the land rehabilitation, we've gone from harvesting peat to rehabilitating the land to, to turn it into becoming a carbon sink. And we're hoping in the future that this will be able to monetize this in some way. On the recycling business, uh, I think again, this is part of the circular economy. We're collecting waste, we're segregating it, we're extracting um, resources out of it, and we're trying to produce new products with it. We're, we're producing biomethane from a, a landfill that we operate in, in Kildare also. And then uh, the piece I'm here to talk about today, the renewable energy business. So just a bit of a deeper dive into the renewable energy business. So today we've almost 1,000 megawatts of, of generation capacity on the island. We have the Eden Dairy Complex, which is now a biomass plant exclusively from December. We have a peaking plant on the site. We have um, about f almost 600 megawatts of uh, operational wind farms, um, some of the largest in the country, and uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier, the first wind farm was built by Board Mona in 1992 in Bellacarig. It's still in operation today, and nobody expected at the time that it would last this long. But we're going to keep it going and hoping to repower that. Uh, there were 21 turbines, 300 kilowatts each, and then there was one fleet leader, which was 450 kilowatts. We're going to replace that complete farm with a single wind turbine, uh, which will be the equivalent output when we repower the site in the next number of years. So the advances in technology have been uh, uh, greatly improved, similar to what Ken has said in the advances in technology in the biomass industry, similar in other industries. And we have a massive development pipeline. 
We've got almost 2,000 megawatts of onshore wind in development. We've got another 2,000 megawatts of, of offshore wind in development. We have some thermal plants in development because, a uh, uh, slide I'll show you later, we can't operate the system exclusively on intermittent renewable power. The system needs backup and the mechanisms have to be there to do that. We're developing solar farms and co-locating them with our wind, uh, wind turbines on, on the sites that we have and we're developing a fleet of battery storage technologies as well to enhance the capability to provide security on the system. So just a, a couple of uh, notes that I took from, um, from Airgrid here. And Airgrid uh, recently did an adequacy supply uh, assessment on the island. And from now until 2030, they believe that every year we have capacity deficits mm -hmm. on the island. So that means there's a risk of loss of load on the system between now and 2030. So if there was ever a perception that we needed to work together to uh, uh, you know, create security to supply through the resources that we have, wind and now particularly biomass, now is the time to do it. So Eden Theory Power's contribution to, to the, the system here. First of all, um, security of supply benefits. 80% of the material that we, we uh, consume in the plant is indigenous material. From people like Ken, who's developed the systems over time to maximize the biomass resource from the forestry and creating value for the, for the end users. The socioeconomic benefits. We spend probably 25 million a year into the local economy within the radius of the power plant to suppliers that supply it and all of the knock-on uh, impact and jobs affected that. The greenhouse gas benefits, the sustainability. Uh, biomass is considered a carbon neutral fuel, so every megawatt that we produce in this thermal plant is displacing fossil fuels on the Irish system, either displacing gas, coal or oil. Uh, alignment with the just transition. Again, I suppose we've transitioned a lot of the employees who worked in the uh, peat industry. A number of them are now working in the power plant. A number of them are working on other activities that we're doing. So we're, we're trying to maintain the security of, for jobs and for careers for people in the, in the company. And finally, uh, biomass uh, at Eden Dairy Power uh, is not competing with renewable heat. There are different products that are required. The kind of... Um, uh, material that we use is probably the lowest grade material of everything that comes out of the, the biomass industry and the higher grade material and generally the smaller the appliance the more sophisticated or the more refined the fuel has to be so we're never going to be in competition with that and we feel that we're enhancing the whole supply chain that will enhance the, um, the capability of producing a product for the renewable heat sector also. So again, Eden Dairy Power's um, advantages here. So does it, it has the potential, or the plant that's there already, which was built in 2000 by a Finnish company called Fortum, was sold to Eon in the game of cards in 2003, and was bought by Bordemont in 2006. Now, ironically, the reason the Bordemont had bought the plant in 2006 because they saw the threat of co-fueling uh, as a threat to their future of peat production. And that has since pivoted completely. And now Eden Dairy Power is the cornerstone of the renewable energy business in Bordemona, being the single, single largest producer of, of uh, renewable electricity on the island. The current reef of support, however, is only supports 30% of the plant. And that's a challenge for us. So we have security on revenue of 30%, unlike a wind farm that gets 100% support for its full output, we only have 30%. So we have huge capability there. That mil uh, million megawatt hours could power almost a quarter of a million houses a year with renewable electricity. So the potential is there for us. Um, major investment in Eden Dairy Power in 23 and 24. We're spending of the order of 30 million to enhance the capability of the plant to take biomass. Biomass has some slight differences to, to peat, uh, and the investment here will secure reliability of the plant in the future from now until at least 2035. Uh, and that's the line of sight we have at the minute. And certainly from what Airgrid are saying, this plant is needed on the system, and we can't afford to lose any more power plants off the system because of the security of supply situation and capacity supply situation. There's no grid infrastructure required. When we develop a, a, a renewable energy project, one of the most difficult things to get is grid, because not only do you have to get the planning for it, which is a challenge in itself, you then have got to get way leaves across land and build the grid. So this plant already has the grid there, and we, we don't need that. 
There's strong growth forecast in the forestry industry, and I have a slide that will talk about that uh, later on. And then the tolerances that uh, uh, for the fuel that Eden Dairy have. We can take a broad range of our, and mix of materials. If you look at our stand outside, you can see some of the examples and some of the examples of the brash that was historically left on the forest floor to rot, but is now coming to the plant and producing renewable electricity and enhancing our, our capabilities to meet our, our national and international targets. Uh, I suppose one of the other solution, uh, solutions that we're providing, we all know in the industry the issue with ash dieback, and the unfortunate thing is that most of the ash in the country is probably going to die uh, uh, between now and the next, next number of years. So Eden Dairy Power is, one of the, is, is the only plant in the country certified by the Department of Agriculture to dispose of this material. So, you know, we in conjunction with the industry are trying to provide a solution and to provide some value for the diseased material that has no other commercial value. The department don't want this material to be burned in low temperature technology devices. They want it to be consumed either buried or consumed in Eden Dairy Power in a high temperature environment that uh, uh, kills off the disease that, that has caused this problem in the first place. So we believe there's about a million tons of this uh, material out there, and we will take uh, all of it, as, uh, and we will provide a, a return on, for, the, for the grower in this. Um, so look at, if, if you need inf further information on that, please visit our stand uh, in, the, in the reception area. Um, I suppose Eden Dairy Power contributing to national security supply. We have a huge problem at the minute. I think one of the speakers said earlier, 53% of the power was produced from gas last year. And only about 30% of our gas is coming from the carb gas field at the minute, and that's dwindling. No more licenses are being issued, so we're going to become more and more dependent. So uh, our solution to this is renewable electricity in the form of intermittent renewables, solar and wind, but the system needs backup supply, and this plant has the capability to do that and has capacity to do more of it if we can get the material into the plant at, at a reasonable cost. So we're critical in the diversification of, of the portfolio on the system and uh, as I said we're the only dispatchable renewable plant on the system and if we don't run another dispatchable plant has to run in our place that is a, a fossil based plant. This is a slide I've taken from a, a, a report that was produced by Coford, and it looks at the projected available material in the forest industry in Ireland over the next number of years. I presented this slide back in 2020. So in, in 2020, there were, or 2018 actually, there were 4 million tonnes of material produced, and, and the projection on the curve, the top curve, the blue curve, and it indicates what is projected to be produced based on the planting uh, that has happened historically. And with the help of people like Ken and the uh, advancement in, in the systems and the efficiencies that are, that are produced, uh, this could be even higher. And what we've seen in 2022, that was 4.3 million tonnes of material produced from the Irish forestry sector. And the residue from that, that material is coming uh, to Eden Dairy. About 17% of that 4.3 million tonnes ends up as residue, whether it's saw log, brash, or forest thinnings. And uh, based on future projections, we think there is sufficient material in the country, if it's uh, realised, to enhance and more than double the output of the, the uh, plant in Eden Dairy to uh, produce indigenous renewable electricity on the island of Ireland and uh, enhance the security of, the, of supply. So finally, biomass, uh, or not finally, but biomass in numbers, 4.3 million uh, tonnes of material harvested in, in 2022, 6 million tonnes projected to be harvested by, by 2030. 300,000 tonnes of that material came to Eden Dairy and was, uh, was turned into renewable electricity. We can provide a, an outlet uh, and a value for the, the grower uh, by using this material. We're helping to develop supply chains, we're helping to develop advancements in harvesting, uh, particularly brash harvesting, uh, to create efficiencies in the supply chain, to enhance the value for the consumer, and to create securities of supply in our electricity system. We're creating a robust supply chain in Ireland uh, for the future bioenergy economy, because if we look at places like Finland, they were where we were a number of years ago. They've moved on now and they're looking at biofuels and biolic liquids and moving away from 
uh, burning material. So we see Eden Dairy as an interim solution for this material that's available in the country, and we're now looking at future options, whether it's uh, biofuels or other higher value products coming from the forestry sector. But in any industry, the first thing you've got to create is a supply chain. We've created that. The next thing we're going to do is look at the options of what we can do to enhance this going forward and to enhance the bioenergy economy. So in conclusion, um, we have a government target to reach 100% renewable electricity by uh, 2050. We've reached that in Eden Dairy 25 years earlier, with the help of a lot of the people in this room, and with the help of forest growers, suppliers, and people working together as a team to, uh, to, to create this value chain in Ireland. Uh, we're, in 2022, 80% of the supplies that we got are, were indigenous material. We do import small uh, quantities of material, and we will have to continue to do that. And some of that material is used to balance the kind of mix of, of Irish products that we have. We're the only on-demand renewable plant on the system. Airgood says we need more on-demand systems, and we have the capability to increase the output of the plant if that material is, is provided. Listen, thank you very much for giving me the time to present this to you today. I'm just going to ask the question again. When I mention Border Mona, who thinks of renewable energy and the largest renewable energy in, uh, provider in the country? Anybody didn't put, put up your hand, you're not getting lunch. Okay, listen, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. It's good to see a company we all own part of doing so well. Um, but no, look, it's been very good to see the success there and how it's moved forward. We have a couple of questions before we go into a panel discussion then, so um, actually I'm going to um, hand down the mic to the, a couple of speakers. Uh, the first question there was in terms of uh, to Porik, in the, terms of the expanding gas net networks into parts of the country that's not already in. Um, is there any discussion about f further expanding that network? So there is some consideration. So, for example, uh, I mentioned central grid injection facilities, and based on the, the study we, we published, we would need five of those. There's a little bit further detail in that in the report where, uh, if I take an area, for instance, like Donegal, uh, in that report there's, I think, 550 gigawatt hours of biomethane identified in projects in, in Donegal. And I can assure you that's not all the projects in Donegal. There are one or two. Some people didn't want to get involved in the report because they're applying for planning permission and things like that, and they want to keep it very low key, uh, which I understand. Um, but I think we were looking at, for instance, uh, we have, I think, three or four counties where we don't have gas network, and Donegal would be one of those. So the, the, the solution there might be to bring gas pipelines across the border from Derry or from Straban. I think there's a question that I'm asking internally in our own organization about that. It's like, how can you have uh, a pipeline and gas customers in Straban and not have them across the river in Lifford, in the county town in Donegal? So there are discussions about that, but there's also a sensitivity in expanding the gas network because at the moment, over 99% of the gas is, is fossil gas. So uh, there's a kind of chicken and egg, or in this case, maybe chicken manure and methane uh, issue. So that I think once we start getting the biomethane into the grid and start getting that moving, which I hope will happen soon, then I think there'll be a bit more openness to kind of expanding the gas networks to new towns. The other thing I would say is, and the reason I mentioned Donegal is, Ireland has a huge potential for hydrogen. And I know it's not really part of the, sub the, the subject matter here today. And that doesn't compete with anything that's going on in this room. You know, that will be a new source of fuel. But it, Ireland is, people have said, like, oh, we could be the new Saudi Arabia and things like that. But in order to access it, Donegal is one of the areas where it's going to be a hotspot for hydrogen, possibly, uh, because the wind resource is there. It'll be produced from wind. And if you don't have a pipeline, you're not going to, you can transport it by electrical means. But I suppose what I would say is, to give you a very simple example, the gas interconnector transports over, I think it's 32 times more electricity are more energy than the electricity interconnector. So when people talk about interconnectors, if you really want to transport large amounts of energy, I'd be looking for a pipeline rather than an electricity power line. And I've worked in both sectors myself, so I have a fair idea of what's involved. And it's also cheaper. It's about half the cost of transporting a kilowatt of gas than it is to transport a kilowatt of electricity. So these are important okay. features for the country. Anyway, that's enough for that's me. Okay. No worries. Thanks very much, Park. And um, you can hold on to the mic there. Or it'll be uh, I have a question in for I suppose for Ken and for Tom. 
and also for Dylan, just in terms of certification of fuels, of, of biomass, just are you, can you already outline quite a lot of your experience on that? Uh, the question is, is there a need, first of all, um, what's in place at the moment? You've outlined that in your, in your situation. Um, but also, do you think there's a need for support from government, from state agencies, to look at how to recertify our fuels going forward? Yeah, it's something I never thought much about, but uh, support. I think certification is very important. It raises standards, and there's, there's a phenomenal cost to do that. If I had to know the effort I had to make initially with doing this, I would have thought about it a bit different. Um, the other side to it, from my point of view, is our customers are benefiting from certification to, because if they're, if they're carbon trading, there's an uplift there. But if they're not paid, benefit from carbon trading, there's a big cost to get certification. So I, yes, it would want support okay. from... Yeah, to, to get, it, get it in place. Um, yeah, Tom? Yeah, if I could also just respond to that. Uh, we have a requirement as a company to be, uh, if we're supported through a capacity payment or a refit payment, the European Red 2 directive applies to us. So we have to be certified to Red 2. We're currently working with SEAI uh, to establish a system to do that. And we're duplicating what has been done in Denmark. But what we're experiencing is it's actually more difficult to do it in Ireland than it is to do it in Denmark. And if this is a European directive, there should be parity uh, in all jurisdictions in order that there isn't um, uh, more difficult uh, difficulties in Ireland than there are in places like Denmark and Holland. So, but we're working very, very closely with SEAI. We hope to have a conclusion uh, on this by the end of the year, and we're hoping to have Red 2 certification uh, early next year. Okay. 